I've got to give a huge thank you to our sponsors, Prosys. We're doing it up big this time around. We're in a studio. I can't believe it. I'm like a kid in a candy store. There's wires everywhere. You all can't see it, but there's wires literally everywhere. I feel like a professional and it is <laughs> way more than I should be getting. But a man that does deserve this kind of <laughs> professionality is my man who connects countries. He connects so much. He needs no introduction. We've got Euro, the head of AI from Prosys, coming up onto the stage to join me and talk for a minute about the LLMs marketplace and the LLMs in production and how we fuse these two things together this time around. So Euro, come on up, man. I see you there waiting. You're excited to come, huh? Thank you very much. What's going on? How's the family? That's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it's great to have you here, dude. What is LLM marketplace? Uh, it's our internal uh, conference, which we have run for several years, where you have been guests, you have been moderator mm -hmm. for some of that work. Um, and the reason is why we do it is because the community, our community, is about a thousand data science, machine learning wow. experts across the globe. I mean, it makes sense to bring them together. Yeah. Um, why do we do it? Because Prosus is a very large consumer internet company. Yeah, what is Prosus? Okay. Yeah, and uh, um, everything that we do has to do with platforms that connect buyers and sellers across the globe. Um, we serve about a quarter of the global population, so it's very large. Wow. Um, you know some of our brands because they are global, Udemy or Stack Overflow. Very, I've heard of them. I think very, let's say, known in this community in particular. But then also uh, local like iFood in Brazil or Swig in India. And so mm. Because everything we do um, is, uh, let's say, these platforms, we need to use machine learning at scale across the operations. So we have hundreds of models in production, but also close to 1,000. Uh, scientists, data science, machine learning experts, and so on. It makes sense to bring them together. We learn from each other. We invite people from the community. We invite people from outside. Some of our, let's say, uh, colleagues are part of the ML community. So why don't we do it together this year? Because we can do it in public and not in private. Well, I'm so thankful that you did because up until this year, it's been a little bit of a secret that I've had that I get to participate in right. the marketplace, but nobody else gets to see it. And this year we decided to open it up. We decided to do this jointly. And I'm very thankful that we did. I also know that you spend a lot of time thinking about where things are going and what is coming next. You all are doing, you have a ton of use cases, both traditional ML and these new LLMs. What are some trends that you have been seeing? Where do you think the puck's going? Can you share some of that with us? I'm happy to do that. And by the way, more than trends, it is the driver. So what we think um, moves the plot for the next few years. So I have some observation love to share, picked from some of the work that we do internally. Hopefully that creates debate and uh, some I agree or disagree with what we see. But yeah. in any case, I mean, I think there's a slide where people can ask questions. So if you, oh. Yeah, if you have a debate on what Euro is saying, there's the Slido right now. We're going to be throwing up the QR code right here. There's also another one right here. I think there's some we could put it here too. We could put it over here even. We'll put it everywhere. So get your phone out, join us in Slido, mention some things, or put in the chat what you are thinking, and we'll moderate that. But Euro, let's hear what you are thinking for the next couple of years, man. Thank you. So this is part of the work that we do uh, at all times, which is mapping what um, moves the plot of generative AI, AI in general, in the medium term. And the reason why we do it is because we um, are a global internet company, but also a large investor. Therefore, we need some guidance to understand the way we think about all this and where things are going. So uh, we like to... Um, think of drivers in this domain in what we call gravitational. They seem to have some sort of predefined path. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of divergence in terms of how well we can predict. But in any case, things seem to go in that direction. Patterns that emerge from the usage. Uh, so how do we actually learn to use these tools, how to deploy them in production and so on. But there are also a certain number of drivers that might accelerate or delay everything that we do. Um, this is just a subset of what we um, work on. And I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time on these four that seem to be connected to many of the teams of the conference um, today. Let me start with scaling low. So this is something which is very well known, has been postulated a few years back by several organizations, OpenAI and Anthropic uh, in particular. And it has to do with a couple of things. The first one is that the model capabilities increase with compute, data, and model size. Um, 
it means that the loss function can be more or less predicted if you deploy more compute, with, if you have more data, if you have more parameters. There are interlinks between these three, so they're not independent, obviously. And to the degree to which this can be generalized beyond a certain amount of time is a subject of debate. But everything that we have seen so far is that this trend is going to continue for some time, maybe one, maybe three years, maybe longer, but in any case for some time. So there's one thing. The second thing is that um, we have seen it from practice, but we also see from um, research that the unit cost of quality, so much it costs to achieve a certain quality, tends to decrease over time. Estimates about half, it goes 50% uh, lower every 16 months. Be that 12 or 18, it doesn't matter. That's the trend, and we can see that in practice as well. So you have two trends. On the one hand, you have the advantage of throwing, let's say, deploying capital, if you want, to compute, to parameters and data and so on. And the other, that capital becomes more efficient. So it's almost inevitable that we are going to have a stream of models in the next few years that are better, significantly better than the models that we had only last year, or the last six months, and that continue for a while. Which is important for because you know a lot of what we do is predicated on this on these models getting better and multiple tasks. It also makes it hard to decide where to invest because many of the things that we do now, which means using at best the tools that we have at this point in time, may become obsolete in a year, right before they become marketable, because models can basically eliminate that need. So that makes investing in this area particularly interesting, but also challenging. The fact that, let's say, you can sort of predict where the loss of these models can go has obviously a correlation with quality because that's what we care about. Here you can see well-known diagram of the relationship between GPT-3.5 and GPT-4, how much we gain in this particular case the, in the quality of exams between 3.5 and 4 in a period of time which is relatively short, I think it's less than one year. However, what matters here it's also the nature of what we call the jagged frontier. So if you look at every human task, there is a certain type of task where humans are good at, right? And then if you make it a little bit difficult, maybe we continue being good. After a certain point, it becomes too hard and we fail. So for every task, we have a sort of idea of what's the sort of human frontier. If you stay to the left, we know that we can do it. Stay to the right, we know that we don't. When you deploy these models, that frontier becomes much different. It's jagged in the sense that it has a strange shape, which is different for every model. But what makes, what, why that's important is because on certain tasks, that frontier is much, much far away from the human one. So these models just do much, much better than any average human. But in other places, which, you know, there's not obvious which ones they are, they are much less capable. So when you deploy these models, you have to have an idea, and ideally you would need to predict where this frontier is. And we are not very good at I don't think anybody around in the, in the community, but in any case in the science in general, is good at making this prediction. So the way, that, the way that we sort of compensate for that, we use multiple models, which sort of create a, uh, a frontier, which is the total of those or we do trial and error. So one of the areas where hopefully today we hear some ideas or uh, maybe somebody has better solutions, how can we predict this Jack Frontier, where it is? It will make a big difference in terms of deployments. The next area where we pay attention and we think it is um, fundamental for what is going to happen next is agents. So for everybody that has been in computer science for you know, some time, you know that agents has always been one of these areas where people spend a lot of time in research and tests, but it has always been very, very hard to deploy agents at scale. Now we have models, LLMs, that can serve for that purpose because they can break down um, the, the, the type of task that they want an agent to do, and for each task then define how to do it, use perhaps external tools, and use memory and action. They can also reflect about how these um, models perform, iterate until you find a solution. So it is promising. It is actually one of probably the most promising thing we have seen in a while because agents are a step change. What we find interesting, it's also how much research has been activated by LLMs in this area. You can see here the number of papers before 23 and those after 23. So there's a literal explosion. So 
Research is going fast, progress is fast, and there's a clear demand. We see demand for these tools everywhere across the entire group of companies that we have, but in, across the entire industry. However, it's also very early days, right? Current agents are experimental. It's easy to create a demo. It's really hard to create reliable applications at scale. So we, we tend to believe, and here you may or may not agree, that in the next, let's say, months or years, couple of years, you will see first agents that try to get better at specific niches. So it can be, for instance, where you have tools combined with LLMs in a very specific domain, or um, agents that do the same type of work that we do, so data analysts. So they create code, execute the code, and then give you the result. Because there's an element of being more controllable once you have this kind of boundary conditions. Of course, by doing this, there's an array of reliability, security, and ethical concerns that we need to address. In general, if you look at agents and everything that um, uh, LLMs make it possible for agents, we start thinking that perhaps we should think about this one as an operating system rather than models and so on. It looks like this is a paradigm of computing, which is very early stage, but it is a new paradigm of computing. So instead of thinking of models, we might want to think about as operating systems for reasoning, and that obviously opens a certain number of additional um, discussions. The next one, uh, which is an area where we pay a lot of attention, is open source. So um, in the last year, I mean two years and so on, we see a stream of open source models that have been released for many reasons, but the, the reason why we care about is because some use cases really need models you can deploy in premise, you need all control and so on. It's also true that if you map the performances of these models against a certain number of benchmarks, then proprietary models like GPT-4, uh, anthropic models, and so on, they're still better, almost everywhere, right? While the open source models are improving, but they're not there yet. So you have a situation in which, for the time being, proprietary large models are still better than almost anything which is out there. However, there's also an increasing amount of practice and research that use, demonstrates that if you narrow down the task, and if you have the proper data for training, then you can have open source models which are fine-tuned and exceed uh, the standard models, so the proprietary models. Does it matter all this? Well, the first one matters that proprietary is generally better than open source now, because in some situations where you really need the top performance of a model, think about healthcare, you will never take a model which is 1% less. You just take the best one. But in other situations where you have 100 models, all give you a plausible answer, a summarization, for instance, it doesn't matter. Then many other, let's say, trade-offs become important. So we believe that any solution going forward for some time will have a portfolio of models that use some proprietor, some open source. Some are going to pure open source as they are, some are fine-tuned and so on. And this is going to be more or less the, uh, the way that we see the relationship between products and open source going forward. The last one that I want to pay a little bit of attention on is this idea that, in general, what you really want is personalized augmented models to uh, deploy for your applications. They incur costs. And if you plot all the options that you have, starting from an existing model to a model that really does what you want, well, you start with prompting, then you can chain models, put more than one to do the same task, and then combine it. You might want plugins, then of course there's the entire domain of augmented um, generation. And then you get to the point of fine tuning, then you can align, and then if nothing works, you train your own models. Now, obviously with all this, these drivers of making the models larger, better over time, a lot of the things can be done on the left side of this diagram. Just prompting might be sufficient for what you do. But it's also true that in many cases you have to go to the right hand side. When you get to the right-hand side train ground up, then compute costs become important, and then may or may be a threshold. You know, you can or cannot afford. It might be possible or not. Many more people will use fine-tuning. So we have done a lot of work on fine-tuning. We have fine-tuned many, many models, including the llamas that we have seen in the introduction here, and we talk about a lot during the day. 
And the fine tuning is an interesting thing because I think we overlook, uh, we underestimate the data cost of fine tuning. In all the experiments that we've done, most of the experiments with, that we have done, the computing costs are a portion, but many times it's a small portion of the total cost. You need to create databases, curate data sets. This curation has to be done in many different directions because you might need to fine tune in multiple ways to achieve what you get. And this cannot be something that you actually outsource. It needs, it requires competent experts, competent people that know how the data works, they know the domain where they work, and they also know how data is used for models. So I think if there is one area where we, we sort of don't spend sufficient time, we don't have enough, let's say, tools here, is how do we manage the data preparation for fine-tuning? Because in practice, it makes a lot of difference. I'm not sure if you agree or disagree with all this, but in any case, um, hopefully you have comments and you can um, put them in Slido. It would be great if some of these themes are discussed today and we can learn from the collective experience of this group. With that, Demetrios. All right, Juro. I wasn't expecting you to be uh, such a visionary. And it was a bit of a surprise. Mm. I'm going to say that you are going to be my co-shaman. We're going to be visionaries together, talking through this journey. I'll guide us. You see the visions. You project it to the future. Now, there is one thing, because I'm waiting for the stuff to come through on Slido right now, but I've got a question for you after that talk. And I absolutely love the slide where you go through all the different pieces. That is so cool to see, and this data prep is huge. But... When it comes to you being a visionary, man, like why is this so important? Why do you spend so many cycles thinking about it? Well, listen, I mean, uh, we have been using machine learning, let's say, call it pre-gen AI, right, uh, for, for several years. And at the scale where we operate, um, you couldn't really run these businesses without machine learning. So, so it is not something that you is nice to have. You need to have for the operation scale where we are. So we know the importance of all this. A number of use cases could not be possible before, so language enables those. So you really want to find out when that's the case. But fundamentally, we believe this is a new computing paradigm. And computing paradigm, that is going to change technology companies. We are one, so we pay a lot of attention because we want to be in the position of taking advantage of that shift happening, but also being ahead of that. Mm. Well, exactly on that theme, there's a question that came through from Remco, and he's asking about your views on the GPU shortage and the dominance of NVIDIA in generative AI development? Well, there's a lot of discussion about this and that goes beyond, let's say, my views. I think right? I think can tell you what our experience. Yeah. It is, yes, it is something that um, impacts what organizations can do, but we haven't found yet that has limited in any way what we do, right? Mm -hmm. So if that shortage might be, let's say, applicable at some scale for what we do, we don't see that. I do believe that because of, let's say, the interest and the demand, there are going to be multiple suppliers. So uh, it's, it's hard to believe that NVIDIA is going to be the only one in the next two to three years. Well, I'm getting the time. I got to keep time very clean right now. But there is another great question that came through. So rapid fire, real quick, what do you think? Do you see AMD playing a big role with the recent announcements that have come out from Lemini? Yes. I think the CEO of Lemini or CTO of Lemini is going to be speaking later. So you can ask all those questions. But AMD? Yes. Yes. There we go. That's it. <laughs> That's the short one, right? <laughs> That's the rapid fire. Yo, man, I appreciate you coming Thank on you here. Thank, Thank you. Yeah.